evening everyone and i would like to thank the iya uh, organizers for inviting the for the talk and i would like to say thanks to dr ashish babulkar sir who has taught me basics in shoulder and who has been a big backbone over the decades and i would like to thank dr harshad shah sir rajgopal sir manish ravi and uh, shiv shankar sir and two of them have been my examiners in my postgraduate days also and the enthusiasm still remains i would like to <clears throat> uh, discuss about the mri of the shoulder it may not be a mainstream question for the postgraduate postgraduates but definitely there will be a one long question most probably <clears throat> on the cuff tears or on the instability of the shoulder or there may be a spotters in the um, discussion so as uh, uh, the clinical examination and the basic radiology has been done we should know what are the rough muscles around the shoulder or the basic anatomy what we are trying to expect or pathologists what are there we may have to look for in the mr the first thing is the supraspinatus muscle the infraspinatus muscle teres minor the subscap in the front and the long head of bicep these are the basic uh, big muscles which can be identified quite well i think dr ravi has told the shoulder is with multiple layers now the first layer of deltoid has been removed that is what you see now and once the cuff also is removed you can see the capsule you will see the acromion you will see the coracoid and the ligamentous structures there and the ac joint inside that will be the shoulder so now you take out that layer also and see what is inside the capsulo ligamentous structures so there is a the capsule which has thickened in multiple uh, levels superior uh, uh, ligament middle glenohumeral ligament and the inferior glenohumeral ligament attached to the glenoid this is how it looks along with the capsule it is an blend the ligaments are thickening of the capsule they are not separately identifiable then comes what is the difference between other joints and this joint is that there is an structure called long head of bicep which is originating from the superior part of the glenoid so this is the intraarticular structure so we normally see uh, structures lateral to the joint here the long head of bicep is intraarticular so this has got a lot of significance in the pathology and question of pain so then comes long head of biceps in inside the group this information for the post graduates is important that to know that these are the problems which can occur they may not be the mainstream questions but they should know all these things so that they in the future if they want to join into any of these uh, work they know how it works the long head of so what happens when there is this point it is inside the groove here it has come out mri can be fun if it is correlated with the pictures so this is another picture let me make it the pathology subscapular supraspinatus is seen the conjoint tendon is seen the infraspinatus is seen teres minor most of the test as described by my teachers and my colleagues are not very conclusive so we have to depend on to certain extent on the mri and we should know that to read the mri because we see in live the radiologist may read the mri but he doesn't correlate completely with the live structures what we see so we should be in a position to complement the radiologist when we see a tendon supraspinatus tendon or a cuff tendon so the three components in that what are the foot footprint what we see is the attachment to the bone and this is a tendon per se and this is a musculotendinous junction what we look for in cuff pathologists grossly for the examination point of view there is tendinosis it can be different grades there is a tear in tear there is a complete tear there is a partial tear and in partial tears there are articular side tears interstitial side tears bursal side tears for theoretically these are very important to uh, for the long question and all this so when you see a complete tear how it looks it looks like a complete discontinuity it can be at the ten uh, tendon or the at the footprint or at the musculotendinous junction and a double layer of the cuff is also important that there are two layers in the rotator cuff when you see at cuff tear you just not only identify the tear you should know the pattern of the tear also something called delamination tears there are two layers as i told you superior layer and the deep layer 
deep layer. The superficial layer and the deep layer, which are classically seen here. MRI gives enough information. The timing, the duration of the uh, the edges can be seen just like the X-ray. When you see the edges are round, that means the fracture is a little bit older, not a fresh injury. In the same way, you will get enough information here. Then in reality, how this particular picture looks like? This one looks like this in the arthroscopy. You can see the superficial layer. You can see the deep layer. In the same way, how to communicate to the uh, colleagues about a cuff tear? Cuff tear, you should measure it in centimeters anterior to posterior and um, middle to lateral. So you should have landmarks about the acromial clavicular joint. You should have the tip of the acromion and beyond the AC joint. So when somebody asks where is the cuff, you can say, at the lateral border of the acromion, at the middle border of the acromion, beyond the glenoid. So there is some, some, sometimes there may be a short question about the classification of cuff tears, where it is important to not only identify the tendon to see the muscle belly also. So in, in knee joint, we don't see much of muscle bellies. In the shoulder, we have to see the muscle belly because this is prognostically very important, not only just repairing a cuff tear. What is the prognosis? If the muscle belly is too much of fat infiltrated, what you see from here to the uh, end here, the more the fatty infiltration, the lesser chances of re recovery. You may repair a cuff, but it may not be functional. It's like the muscle. Muscle is like the engine of the car. If the engine is not good, there is no point in putting a new tire or a puncture to the uh, tire. <clears throat> so how the incomplete tears look? This is an intra-substance tear. What we see, this looks in a classical way of intra-substance tear here. Between the two layers, there will be a tear. The visual images will give you a lot of information. So the partial bursal surface tear and how we can correlate on the MRI. This is how it looks on the MRI. And then the part partial articular I think we can't hear anything. We lost. Seen an arthroscopy. You have to decide whether to repair or not, whether the partial tear is a real partial tear or only fibers are attached to that. When you insert an instrument and open it up, that becomes a complete tear. <clears throat> so here, other thing, the clinical examination, drop arm sign or a pseudo, sorry, the, the pseudo paralytic shoulder, what Dr. Ashish Babulkar sir was explaining, is about calcification. So calcification MRI looks like this. This is the only condition where a patient wakes you up in the middle of the night, excruciating pain, unbearable pain. How does it look on an arthroscope? And why does it cause pain? Is because this cal calcification sometimes is like a pasty material. It ruptures and then it irritates the joint and then it causes excruciating pain there. So there is a calcification which causes the clinical symptom of acute sudden onset pseudoparalytic shoulder in mostly young adult, young, uh, young adult and ladies. And the reason for this is a pasty material inside the joint. Then comes the uh, Dr. Ravi Chauhan has explained about a, a hollow in the greater tuberosity. These are the cysts what we see on the MRI. The cysts are an indirect indication that the cuff on top is not functional. So there is loss of uh, calcium from there. This is not much significant in the um, theoretical aspect, but for the practical aspect, as we have cancellous screws and cortical screws, because depending on the density of the bone to for fixation, we have to decide what to fix and where to fix the cuff tears. <clears throat> so if you put an anchor into the cystic area without having a proper uh, identification, your anchor will come out. So this also has to be analyzed. And how it looks on an arthroscopy, this is how the rotator cuff tear will be seen there. And the large is seen there. The cuff, which is seen, edges are rounded. That means it is an old tear. We are cleaning the greater tuberosity. Now, one anchors here. So this is very important that uh, for practical surgical purpose. So the anchor will pull out from there. So when there is a cyst, we always have to expect that the weakness of the bone there, the anchor gets pulled out. In the same way, like when you have a cancellous bone, you put a screw, there can be back out because of lack of purchase. So it's very important to understand this phenomenon of cyst lesions. 
Now, coming to the tendinosis, this is quite commonly seen. We see reporting of tendinosis. What exactly means tendinosis? So when you see a ten tendinosis, that, that means that it is not only a tear, it is not a tear, it is a disruption in the internal fiber, that is collection of fluid. So you will be able to see something called thickness over there and fluid collection. And complete tear looks like that. And then coming to the, <clears throat> how does a tear progress? Why should we take MRIs to identify the shoulder pathologies? So the tear starts like this. After some time, there is progression of the tear, and then the tear retracts. And then there is gross retraction. So it is important that the tear is not going to stay there for a longer time. Six months, one year, and two years, that progression of the tear. The repairability and the results also will depend on this one. Then comes the most common question called impingement. So when we see an impingement, that acromion is impinging on the uh, humeral head. So we see a structure of the tendon, which is delaminated and an impingement sign of the acromion. We normally see the secondary signs of impingement. As MRI is not dynamic, we should not, we should not be too much enthusiastic to say that uh, impingement is seen on that. See, secondary signs of impingement are seen. Shoulder may be compensated or decompensated. As uh, explained by my seniors, that even though we see a lot of tears, it doesn't mean that they will be present clinically. The compensation by deltoid and the pectoralis major or the bigger muscles is quite high. What we expect in an instability comp, instability. So three components have to be assessed in the instability, the labrum, capsule, and the bone. So when we talk about labrum, labrum is a 360 degrees picture. So we divide into quadrants or in the, according to the clock, what we see, one o'clock, three o'clock, and five o'clock. This is a normal labrum here, what we see, this is how it looks. And then we start seeing a bank art lesion. There is lifting of the labrum from there and a bony bank art with a piece of bank art. There are a lot of lesions which are described for academic purpose. I would like to go through a few. Parthes lesion where the periosteum also is lifted along with the labrum. This is alpsal lesion, anterior labral periosteal sleeve avulsion, along with the labrum. All the all are the same, the single bigger brother, younger brother, and different multiple types. So the GLAD lesions, the glenoid labrum and articular disruptions. And then how to measure glenoid bone loss? A rough idea about one technique is a best fit method. If there is any doubt, compare with the opposite side. Something slap tear, which is quite commonly asked. Do you know about slap tear? Slap tear is the long head of biceps avulsion. The clinical tests have been described earlier. This is how a slap test looks. And one of the indications for MR arthrograms, where the, the fluid will go and lift up the long head of bicep. Hegel lesion. The clinical tests have been described by Dr. Babulkar. Now you see what is a Hegel lesion in reality. It is the humeral avulsion of the glenohumeral ligament. One of the rarest thing what we see, but it when we repair the labrum, there is chances of failure. The Hegel is this. And then comes the Hillsax lesion. Why does Hillsax lesion occur? Because the, the posterior humeral head rotates and locks in the anterior glenoid. This is how it looks. The humeral head is indented posteriorly. So the essential lesions in the bank art. And now the Hillsax also is one of the essential lesions for the shoulder instability. So instability is a bidirectional component. If there is anterior inferior dislocation, not only anterior inferior structure, the posterior superior structures will also be damaged to certain extent. The same way there is posterior labrum, there are posterior Hillsax lesion, which is commonly missed in an X-ray. One need to be really thorough and take the proper history, epileptics and electric shocks. Most commonly we miss the posterior dislocation. Sometimes they present with their locked shoulders. What we miss about the commenting of an MRI is the AC joint as the pain will be mostly during the night time and <clears throat> acute localized tenderness can be seen. AC joint separation, mild grades and arthro arthropathy can also be identified. We, the miscellaneous structures are muscle edema, paralabral cyst and axillary structures. So what we see, dislocation in elderly, the comment up by, up by my seniors is about that cuff tear also is quite possible. So we see a GT uh, dislocation with a GT fracture, fracture dislocation. So we have reduced the, this thing. We have assessed through the X-ray. We got information and we are happy about it or we want to fix it up with a screw. We have fixed it up. What actually <clears throat> do we miss by not taking an MRI scan? So we miss the cuff attachment. Most of the times it unites, but sometimes it just goes into lysis. The GT goes into lysis even after fixation. This point also has to be noted. So we should not uh, miss a cuff tear along with the dislocation in elderly population. Never miss an examination about the cervical spine. We may not, 
uh, we miss it in a bilateral shoulder pain, that's going to be a big disaster. So the, uh, the MRI of the cervical spine is indicated in and bilateral shoulder pains. And the latest future will be 3D MRIs, which will give a lot of information. Apart from that, it's going to give a, it makes life easier where you can rotate the entire picture and see where is the pathology. But if your brain knows what is the structure damage, then only you'll be able to identify. What your brain doesn't know, your eyes can never see. Anatomy, anatomy, anatomy. You know the good anatomy, you can correlate on the MRI and you can see it on the <clears throat> live surgeries also. Carry home message, all shoulder pains are not frozen shoulders. When you can't examine a shoulder, then it becomes more important to identify the pathology by uh, having an MRI. When the patient is painful, not cooperating for examination, MRI gives a lot of information. It is diagnosis is the first step in treatment. If you don't diagnose, you won't be able to treat the patient. MRI is gold standard for most of the soft tissue injuries. Injuries around the shoulder need not always be bony. Dr. Ravi uh, has been stressing on that point. Injuries around the shoulder need not be only bony, what we see on the X-ray. Early diagnosis, better results because the cuff tear progresses. Not much of correlation is between the symptoms and the amount of damage. This is very important that there may be a massive tear, but the patient is still functionally doing good. This is because of deceptive nature of the shoulder girdle muscles, mostly deltoid. Sometimes it is a bonus if there's cuff tear on one side, degenerative tears are on the both the sides. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.